It's an only mode. Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. You don't have to be Hispanic to work with Hispanic and Latino populations. Today's webinar will be presented by Dr. Emily Maynard, postdoctoral fellow in clinical psychology at Hosford Clinical at UC Barbara St. George Youth Center of Isla Vista in California. I will tell you more about her pretty soon. So during today's webinar, all participants will be muted. The audio will be streamed to the computer. So please make sure your computer speakers are turned on and up to hear today's presentation. So I'm going to review a few housekeeping items. Um, if you notice that your viewer does not fit your screen, you can expand it by clicking the expand button located in the top right corner indicated right here by the red arrow. You'll see that your viewer is expanded to fit the entire screen. And also you can collapse the go to webinar toolbar on the right of your screen by clicking the small red arrow to the left of the toolbar. And then you'll see um, you can click the arrow again to expand the toolbar and it will expand. As I mentioned for today's webinar, all participants will be muted. As we move through the presentation, if you have questions for our presenter, we ask that you use the chat box on the toolbar. Simply type your question and hit send. So what we're going to do is we're going to wait till the end of the presentation and then we'll take a few minutes for questions and answers. A recording of today's webinar along with the PowerPoint slides will be available at our website www.attcnetwork slash Hispanic Latino approximately one week from today. You can also find recordings and PowerPoint slides from all of our past webinars at the same URL. One NAVAC, one NBCC, and one ICNRC continuing education credit is available to those who attend today's live event. So if you're interested in obtaining CEUs from these organizations, please email us at hispaniclatino at uccaribe dot edu. Today's webinar is sponsored by the National Hispanic and Latino ATTC. Um, as of October 1st of 2012, the network was restructured and consists of 10 regional ATTCs, 4 national focus area ATTCs, along with the network coordinating office. So as you can see by this map, the ATTC network regions were realigned to better fit the current HHS regions. And on the left, we have the 4 national focus area ATTCs. The ATTC is funded by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration and serves a critical role in improving the health of the United States. The network achieves this by translating, disseminating, and promoting the adoption and implementation of evidence-based clinical practices and strives to improve the health and wellness of individuals whose lives have been impacted by substance use disorders. So if you want to learn more about the network's products and programs, you can visit attcnetwork.org. As I mentioned, the ATTC network is funded by SAMHSA. SAMHSA strives to reduce the impact of substance use and mental illness on the U.S. communities through its programs and services and demonstrates that behavioral health is essential to health, that prevention works, treatment is effective, and people recover from mental and substance use disorders. So if you want to learn more about SAMHSA, you can visit their website at www.samhsa.gov. So now I'll tell you a little bit more about our presenter. Dr. Emily Maynard received her PhD in clinical psychology from Fordham University. Her pre-doctoral internship was conducted at NYU Bellevue Hospital Center in New York, where she completed rotations in medical psychology, substance use treatment, and inpatient psychiatry. Dr. Maynard received her undergraduate degree in Spanish and Portuguese from Princeton University with a minor in Latin, Latin American Studies, and she was later a Fulbright Fellow to Brazil. Dr. Maynard is bilingual in Spanish and fluent in Brazilian Portuguese. Dr. Maynard's dissertation research examined the experience of being diagnosed with bipolar disorder in emerging adulthood, 
She's particularly interested in diagnostic issues among individuals with severe mental illness, substance use disorders, and personality disorders. The majority of her clinical training has focused on providing care for Latinos and other immigrant groups, and she's versed in family group and individual psychotherapy. She pragmatically draws from behavioral psychology, health psychology, psychodynamic psychotherapy, and humanistic existential per perspectives in providing care for her patients. In addition to the Hotspur Clinic, Dr. Maynard works off-site at the St. George Family Youth Center in Isla Vista, providing psychoeducation and support to Latino youth and their families. So now that we know our presenter, let's get to know the audience, and we're going to do a brief poll questioning for that. Okay. Our first question. Do you currently serve Hispanic and Latino populations with substance use disorders? So 77% of our audience says yes and 23% say no. Next question. Are you planning to serve Hispanic and Latino populations with substance use disorders in the next six months? And 79% of our attendees say yes, 10% no, and 18% don't know. What is your current professional role? Here we have 33% social workers, 35% counselor therapist, 4% faculty research, 17% government, and 17% other. What type of setting do you currently work in? And we have 14% academic, 57% treatment, 21% government, and 13% other. Now we're going to go to our pretest. First question, this is true false. Racism is not an issue in Latin America when compared with the United States. And 18% say true, 83% say false. Next pre-question. There are a higher percentage of Latino, Latina social workers than Latino, Latina psychologists. And 81% of our attendees responded true, 17% false. Our last question. Latin America is considered the most violent region in the world. And we have 18% say true and 75% say false. Okay. So that's our poll questioning now. I'm going to leave you with Dr. Emily Maynard who's going to do the presentation. Thanks, Thais. You're welcome. <laughs> Seeing my screen now? Yes, I can see your screen. Oh, 
Well, first of all, thanks, Darius, for having me. This is a topic that I'm really excited to share with other people. Um, and I'll be talking today, as you said, about the experience of being a non-Latino mental health professional who works with Latino patients. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, so part of the rationale for um, doing this presentation is that there's a growing number of Latinos in the United States. Um, we're estimating now that about 18% of the U.S. population is Hispanic or Latino. However, only about 5% of American psychologists are Hispanic or Latino, and approximately 3% of American social workers are Hispanic or Latino. Therefore, there's um, not equal representation of or approximate rec representation of mental health providers to the population of Latinos. And therefore, it's likely that a lot of Latino patients will be served by non-Latino psychologists and social workers. And some of these may be unfamiliar with the cultural norms and expectations of their patients. I'm just providing this map. Um, it shows the percentage of Hispanic population by county from our last census in 2010. And we can see especially in the border regions, California, Arizona, Texas, also in Florida, really high percentages of Latino and Hispanics. In some, percent, in some counties, from 50 to 100 percent of the inhabitants are Latino. And in mental health care, there's this idea that it's helpful to have service providers who belong to the same race and ethnicity as their, as their patients or clients. And this, this idea really comes from the fact that perhaps people who share a racial or ethnic background can, um, will know something more about their patients that they're working with and will be able to help them. However, when research has looked into the value of matching patient and clinician by racial and ethnic background, they've had mixed results as to whether or not that's actually the best um, for patients. And so even if we did have evidence that it was best for Latino patients to be served by Latino therapists, there just aren't enough Latino therapists to ensure that we can find, um, we can match them with patients. And I would imagine that that's especially the case in those counties that are highly Latino. However, I really believe that non-Latinos are able to provide culturally competent mental health services to Latino patients, given that they have appropriate training and background. And this is part of what I'm hoping to, to do with you today, is to provide um, you with some suggestions, some of my experience as a non-Latino working with Latinos. Um, fortunately, even though there aren't percentage-wise a lot of Latino mental health clinicians, Many um, non-Latinos in the United States, it's possible that they already have a lot of exposure to Latin American languages and cultures. And why do I say this? Well, Spanish is the most taught second language in U.S. schools. And in universities, more students take Spanish than all other foreign languages combined. Um, so I'm hoping that um, in the people that are attending this presentation will have some familiarity with Latino cultures or languages, maybe even being able to provide services in Spanish, but that they may be uncertain how to provide the best care to Latino patients, even given the knowledge they already have. Um, Darice already, I already went over some of my background, but um, I'm a white Anglo-American. I lived in Latin America for a total of three years in Chile, Argentina, and Brazil, a year each in each country between 2000 and 2006. I was a Fulbright, Fulbright Fellow to Brazil, and I majored in Spanish and Portuguese, just including a photo of myself from 2001 uh, with some of my friends in Chile. And then I subsequently did a PhD in clinical psychology and in New York City at Fordham University. I received a lot of clinical training and supervision in Spanish with Latino patients and supervisors um, in different New York City hospitals, including Bellevue Hospital, where I did my clinical internship. And right now, I continue to do clinical work with Latinos at the Hosford Clinic at UC Santa Barbara and at the St. George Youth Center in Isla Vista, California, which serves primarily Mexican youths and families. So I'll just briefly go over the themes that I'll be talking about today. I'm going to be talking about diversity, la diversidad, the diversity of Latin Americans in the United States, 
I'll be talking about trauma and history and how um, understanding the social context of trauma and history of our patients can inform our treatment of psychopathology. I'll be talking briefly about language, using language specifically Spanish in clinical practice. And then I'll touch on some um, themes that are common in the literature about working with Latinos, uh, including personalismo, familismo, machismo, marianismo. And finally, I'm going to talk about how to create a commitment to working with this community if you're not a Latino. So to begin, talking about the diversity of Latin America, um, the region of Latin, Latin America and the Caribbean is considered to include 20 countries. And Spanish and Portuguese are the most widely spoken languages in this region. However, French, Creole, English, and numerous indigenous languages are also spoken. About 75% of Latinos or Latin Americans in the United States are Mexican, Cuban, or Puerto Rican. Um, those are the groups. Those are the groups that are sending the most immigrants, or have sent the most immigrants to the United States. And consequently, I'll be focusing my presentation on Spanish-speaking Latin Americans, while also acknowledging that we may see patients from Latin America that speak Portuguese or speak French or English even. Um, one thing to think about with diversity in such a large region, um, there's also a lot of racial and ethnic diversity. And all of the major U.S. racial categories that we find on our census are represented in Latin America. So there are people of European, African, indigenous, and Asian descent, and mixtures of all of those different descents. However, race and ethnicity function slightly differently in Latin America than in the United States. I'll be talking a little bit more about that, but it's just a warning to clinicians that um, often racial boundaries in Latin Americans are not as clearly defined due to earlier histories of interracial mixing. However, racism does exist in Latin America. It functions slightly differently than in the United States, um, but it's alive and unfortunately well. I like to bring in this slide when I do presentations of this kind to just demonstrate how diverse Latin Americans can be. So I have um, five different Latin American celebrities here of different races and ethnicities. And I just show this so that you can see they're of different, you know, different backgrounds, visibly different. Um, we have here, starting over here, Don Francisco. He's a host of a very popular variety show called Sabado Gigante. We have Shakira the singer. We have Alberto Fujimori, the former Peruvian president, Michelle Bachelet, the current Chilean president, and Celia Cruz, um, a singer. And then these are their different ancestries. Um, Don Francisco is German and of German and Jewish descent, so there are large, large communities of people of Jewish descent in Latin America. Um, we also have Shakira, who's of Middle Eastern and Southern European descent, Lebanese, Macedonian, Spanish, Italian. Um, Alberto Fujimori, as his name would suggest, is of Japanese descent, but in Peru. And in Peru and in other countries in Latin America, there are people of Japanese, Chinese, Korean descent. Um, Michelle Bachelet is of um, different European ancestry. And Celia Cruz is of African or mixed race ancestry, and she's from Cuba. This slide is just intended to illustrate some of the geographic and cultural diversity of Latin America. Across Latin America, we have a range of landscapes, um, not just tropical. There are glaciers in Patagonia. There are deserts. Um, we have um, indigenous people, such as the weavers that I showed in the bottom right, as well as representations of European culture um, embodied by these institutions like the Palacio de Bellas Artes in Mexico City, which is a Beaux-Arts institution, and the, the National Library in Buenos Aires, which is in the brutalist style. So this is also just intended to um, depict the, 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 the wide variety of cultures that we might encounter in Latin America and that our patients might be bringing to us here in this country. So in approaching the themes of race and ethnicity and psychotherapy with Latinos, it's important to understand that nationality or place of origin may be a stronger mar marker of identity for Latinos living in the US than race. So um, your patients may 
refer more to the fact that they're Mexican, they're Puerto Rican, rather than saying I am Latino or even rather than saying I'm white or I'm black or I'm indigenous. It's also important that we don't assume that phenotype, what a person looks like, is equal to their genotype or their, their, their ancestry. So because of longer histories of racial mixing in Latin America, um, people may have very diverse ancestries and someone who appears us, to us to be white may have a grandparent, may have a brother or sister who looks black in, to Americans. And likewise, someone might have light or dark skin and not consider themselves to belong to the racial ethnic group that they would belong to in the United States. And also in Latin America, divisions of class, education, access to resources tend to be more prominent social divisions than race. Well, you should also consider with working with diverse patients from Latin America, um, is your patient from a rural area or are they from an urban area? Um, do they belong to an indigenous group? Do they avow any indigenous identities or do they consider themselves to be more of the, the dominant um, racial ethnic group in their country? I've also found as a white American, it's really helpful for me to acknowledge my own race and ethnicity in my work with Latinos, and I would encourage other clinicians to do the same, especially if you speak Spanish. If you speak Spanish and you're not Latino, patients will naturally have curiosity about how you acquired it, or they will you know, believe that you are Latino. And if you don't answer questions about language acquisition or your own race or ethnicity, you might be perceived by patients as being hostile, strange, or you might even invoke some paranoia, like why does this person speak Spanish? I don't understand. Um, they're not telling me where they're from. So the traditional psychotherapeutic stance of not disclosing a lot of personal information may backfire here if you're working with um, Latinos or with anyone else in a different language. And I found it's helpful to just give a brief explanation and then to move on. So in my case, I say, well, I speak Spanish because I lived in Chile and Argentina for a few years. I say, pues, yo viví en Chile and Argentina por un par de años y por eso hablo español. And then the patient's usually like, oh, okay. And then they go back to talking about what they came there to talk about. I would strongly recommend that in working with Latinos and working with people that belong to a group that you're not familiar with to assume a position of cultural humility and curiosity about their lives, to really approach the encounter as, I don't know very much, but I do know something and I'm curious to know more. However, we should also educate ourselves about the countries and regions where our patients come from. It's not the patient's responsibility to, to teach us everything we need to know about working with Mexicans from rural areas, for example. And I just include this slide of Cuenca, Ecuador, because there was a time when I was seeing a lot of patients in New York City from Ecuador, and I started asking them what, what part of Ecuador they were from. And I knew of Quito, I knew of Guayaquil, and they kept saying Cuenca. And that was how I discovered that there were just a large group of people from Cuenca who had immigrated to New York. And I tried to learn a little bit more about Cuenca, which is this beautiful colonial city in Ecuador. Now I'm going to move to talk about trauma and history in working with Latin Americans. Uh, many Latinos in the US are coming um, to the United States from countries with recent histories of civil war, oppressive or authoritarian regimes, and economic crises. And Latin America is now considered the most violent region in the world. It has the highest homicide rates. Um, studies have found that a significant number of Latinos have a history of exposure to political violence. And um, a large number, 76%, endorsed lifetime exposure to other trauma tests. So this is a group that appears to have a lot of exposure to trauma. This is just a map showing the most violent regions in the world by homicide rate. Um, and you can see that Brazil, um, Colombia, Venezuela, um, Northern Central America, Mexico, and Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico are pretty high up there in terms of um, homicide rate. So we should take into account that right now there's a lot going on in the region of Latin America. We have the ongoing influence of the drug trade, the narcotrafico in the Andean region and in Mexico and Central America. We have changes in the immigration policy by the U.S. government that is making it more difficult for people to immigrate. We also have 
right now the collapse of the Venezuelan economy and political system, if you read the news and hear what's happening in Venezuela, it's really astonishing. Um, recently we had the death of Fidel Castro in Cuba, which we don't really know what's going to happen after his death. Um, certainly more opening towards the United States economically, but we don't know the other repercussions. And then in a little more uh, distant past, we had a, a huge economic crisis in Argentina in 2002 that reverberated across the region. And if we go back just a little bit further, um, in Central America in the 1980s, many countries were engaged in civil war and many people came to the United States as refugees from, their, from that war. Since 1959, when the Cuban Revolution happened, um, there have been people who fled Cuba. Um, in the 1970s and 80s, a number of countries in southern South America, Chile, Argentina, and Brazil, were under authoritarian dictatorships. We have a picture here of Augusto Pinochet, and here's Fidel Castro. Um, and in a lot of these cases, the United States actually supported non-democratic regimes across the region, which is important to keep in mind when working with Latin Americans from these countries. Now I want to talk a little even further past, go to the Mexican-American War um, in 1848 in which the, ter the states that are now California, Nevada, Utah, Arizona, and parts of New Mexico um, were ceded to the United States from Mexico. And then in the Spanish-American War in 1898, the Spanish colony of Puerto Rico became the American colony of Puerto Rico and the United States also gained control of the Philippines and Guantanamo Bay in Cuba. Even longer ago, they, um, we know that Europeans first came to Latin America in 1492 and then they established um, colonial um, communities that involved forced labor and conquest of indigenous communities, widespread enslavement of Africans, and extractive economic systems that were similar to the American South. So they were based on the large-scale production of commodities on plantation style um, haciendas. And so why is all this important when we work with Latin Americans? Well, I think it's important to think about because we may be working with people that are not just traumatized from their own lives, but that have a history of trauma in their families and in their countries. And this is what we would call the intergenerational transmission of trauma. And I want to ask us to consider what is psychopathological. We may be going into work with a patient looking for specific symptoms. Um, and for example, with paranoia, someone may be exhibiting paranoid symptoms, but it's important to consider, is this coming from a history of living in an oppressive police state, or is this an instance of individual psychopathology? And also we should consider instances of anxiety or nervios in the context of the current immigration policy and raids on immigrants across the United States. And finally, thinking about psychosis and normative spiritual experiences, uh, I found that Latin Americans have a great openness to the paranormal, to ghosts, to witches, to angels, UFOs. There's a lot more, a lot of interest in these phenomena, and there are also um, non-organized religions such as Santeria, Voodoo, Candomblé, Curandorismo, that um, might be looked at as witchcraft. Um, or more pagan traditions. And when we work with Latino patients, it may be the case that they either believe in the paranormal or are engaged in some kind of religion that taps into the paranormal. And this is different than having psychosis and should be distinguished from psychotic experience. Another reason that I talk a lot about the history of Latin America is that Latin American cultures in general tend to place more importance on the past than white American culture, which is primarily future oriented. We can think of our idea of manifest destiny as always pushing forward in the United States. And Latin American cultures tend to look more at their history and their past. Immigrants, of course, don't leave their past at the border. Coming to a new country, acquiring a new language doesn't mean totally leaving behind the life that you had before. And it's important for us to make space for our patients to talk about the past and about their home country and their immigration experience in psychotherapy. If you're able to provide services in Spanish, having continuity in language 
um, may allow for greater continuity with their past experience. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about el lenguaje or language using Spanish and psychotherapy. Um, many bilingual practitioners such as myself who speak Spanish and English may have learned Spanish in regions different from those of their patients. So for example, I learned Spanish in Chile and Argentina in the southern cone of South America, but I've mostly worked with patients who are from the Caribbean region or who are from Mexico. So I've had to acquire a sort of neutral Spanish, a transnational Spanish um, that I can use with Spanish speakers in the U.S., as well as to use country-specific vocabulary. So what this means is that I tend to avoid using slang terms that I learned in the Southern Cone because they're probably not understood well by my Caribbean or my Mexican patients. I'm going to give you a few examples of this. Um, but it's important if we are clinicians to know how to work with, learn or acquire a clinical Spanish, which is a distinct vocabulary from lay Spanish. And just as in our training we had to learn a sort of clinical English vocabulary, this is the, this is the equivalent in Spanish. And I strongly recommend for practitioners working in Spanish to use a Spanish-Spanish dictionary. This, this dictionary that I have here, the Diccionario de la Lengua Española, is um, considered the, the gold standard in Spanish-Spanish dictionaries. And simply because a lot of country-specific terms, slang terms, are not included in English-Spanish dictionaries. So a few examples from my Caribbean patients. I have, have parents coming in and they would describe their child as a tiger especially little boy, él es un tigre. And that would mean, I was like, what, is, what do they mean he's a tiger? It would mean a very bold little child, a misbehaving kind of mischievous child. Or they would say, oh, this situation fue un revolú. And I'm not sure if it means it was like a revolution, but it, it actually means this was a big mess. Wow, this was just chaotic. Um, another term that people would say, would, they would say un chin for a little bit. So they would say, wait, a, wait for me a little bit. And these are just examples of very regional slang that I've learned in my clinical work. This is not specifically clinical terms, but it's helpful to know. And the same in Mexican Spanish. Um, a lot of patients would say, ahorita, let's do it now. Let's do it right now, ahorita. Um, I learned to say, nos vemos. We'll see each other later. They say, nos miramos. Um, in Mexican Spanish, people use platicar instead of hablar or conversar. And then there's a lot of slang to describe children. Um, so I was used to hearing chicas, muchachos, but my Mexican patients would say, esos chamacos, esos güeyes, esos cuates. And all of these words, I either had to ask them or look it up. So then I think about clinical Spanish as being divided into the lay vocabulary, just common vocabulary that's used to describe emotions and ordinary experiences, and clinical vocabulary to describe disorders and symptoms. So for example, the lay vocabulary is saying something like, que pena, what a pity, how hard that must have been, or me dio mucho coraje, it made me really angry. Or one thing that I really hear, hear a lot is, quiero des desahogarme. I want to unburden myself. I want to vent. I came here to vent. And then the more clinical vocabulary would include things like the names of, of disorders. So like attention deficit disorder, trastorno de déficit de atención, or talking about depression, panic, anxiety, la depresión, el pánico, la ansiedad. Um, mood would be translated as estado de ánimo. And then some other terms from neuropsychology would be like lesión cerebral, it means a brain injury, and derrame is a stroke. So these are, you know, I'm kind of distinguishing between the, the more um, diagnostic vocabulary that it's important to learn so you can communicate with your patients um, the exact nature of their distress, as well as the just common everyday language to talk about what's going on. I strongly urge other bilingual practitioners to continuously work to improve their Spanish and maintain their Spanish. If you don't speak it, 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 it gets lost. And fortunately in the United States there are a lot of Spanish speakers, there are many opportunities to keep practicing Spanish. Now with the internet we have greater access to um, spoken and visual media, films, book, books, music. And I believe that 
learning the language, learning Spanish, is a clear demonstration of one's commitment to Latino and Latino culture and to working with Latinos. Now I have a few words for monolingual practitioners, people who only speak English and are working with Latinos. I want you to be aware that emotions may be conveyed differently in different languages or emotional experiences may have a different valence when talked about in English versus in Spanish. And one thing that you can do with bilingual patients is you can encourage your patients to switch to Spanish when they're discussing emotionally charged material. Even if you don't understand what they're saying in Spanish, for them it can have the effect of um, experiencing that emotion again in a different way in the, the Spanish register. And for other practitioners who speak, who are bilingual but speak English and another language that's not Spanish, who might speak Chinese or Arabic or Portuguese, uh, I encourage you to use what you know yourself about being bilingual to aid your patients. And to keep in mind that you have this shared experience of bilingualism and biculturalism, even if you don't speak Spanish yourself. And I've often thought about this when I've worked with patients who might be Turkish, with patients who are from French-speaking Africa, that even though I don't speak French or Turkish, that I know something about what it's like to um, be bilingual and to be part of two different cultures. Now I'm going to talk briefly about some themes that have been identified in the literature as being particularly salient for working with Latinos. One is called personalismo. It's personalism, the idea of having a more affectionate, personal approach when working with Latinos. Um, cariño is a word that means affection and it's very common for Latin Americans to say, oh, this person was very affectionate as a, a way to praise someone. And they may expect um, more affection or greater personal regard from their therapist than is generally the therapeutic stance that we learn as American therapists. So one way that we can assume a more personalized approach with working with Latinos is to ask about family members because they are more focused on family than white Americans tend to be. But um, we can also just acknowledge that it may take a little long, we may need to spend a little more time in pleasantries with Latino patients at the beginning of a session of talking about how did they get to the session, how was it, how was their health, how was the weather, um, to kind of ease them into the deeper work. And even with a more personalized approach and even with my recommendation to be clear with your patients about how you learn Spanish, it's not that boundaries are aren't present with Latino patients or shouldn't be present, but it's that the boundaries in working with Latinos may be different. So the boundary I may decide to, to hold is that I will tell, disclose the patients how I learned Spanish, but I'm not going to tell them every single thing about my experience in Chile and Argentina, and I'm not going to constantly refer to my experiences. For example, I'm going to still keep the session focused on, on what's going on with my patients. Um, for those of you who speak Spanish, you'll know that there's a difference between a formal you and an informal you. Usted is the formal you, um, and tú or vos are the informal yous. And it's important to know which one to use with your patients and to be attuned to which one they're using. I usually use as a default usted when I'm working with adult patients, and when I'm working with teens or ch children, I say I use an informal tú or vos um, until at some point, the patient may say, like I've had patients who are about my age say, you can stop saying usted, like, you know, we're the same age, can you, can you call me with two? You may also find patients who always address you as usted in the formal because they are treating you as a doctor, a doctora, even if you're not a doctor. Um, there's an assumption that you're a professional and um, Latinos will, will treat that with respect. They will treat you with respect because of your position, and they may expect a more directive therapy at first. Like, I'm going to the therapist, I am going to get advice. The second point I wanted to talk about is familismo, which is this idea that Latino cultures have a greater focus on family functioning rather than on an autonomous individualism, which is the standard usually in the United States. 
Um, and therefore, a lot of American psychotherapies and theories that have been developed in the United States and in Northern Europe prioritize the individual over social or familial function. But um, because of this focus on the family in Latino culture, it's important to ask our patients about their families, acknowledge them, and you know, we may even want to bring them in for family therapy. It can be a very useful modality when working with Latinos. And here are some ways to acknowledge the family role in therapy. You can ask about family members. With children and teens, you can say, send my greetings to your moms, tell your mom or dad I say hi, mandale saludos a tu mamá. You can allow parents of infants or small children to bring their children into psychotherapy with them. And then talking about gender roles in Latin America. A lot of Americans have this idea that Latino cultures are very sexist, very machista. And I think that's part of the truth, but I also think it's important that we acknowledge that the United States has a long way to go in terms of sexism. And um, that when working with patients, rather than seeing them as coming from a terribly sexist culture, as thinking, well, they probably come from a culture that, like mine, has, is, is still developing in its treatment of men and women. Um, this, these ideas of machismo, where men are valued more, a kind of masculine ideal, and then marianismo, which is the female equivalent, that women should sacrifice themselves, they should be like the Virgin Mary. Um, these are ideas that have gained a lot of clout in cultural studies and in therapy studies of Latinos as explanations for gendered behavior among Latin Americans. But they also may be exaggerated and stereotypical ways to view gender relations. So we have to be cautious when invoking them. Um, and just to, in contrast to that, there's this long history of female university education in Latin America. So there are a lot of women that have been educated to high levels and have positions as doctors, judges, engineers, scientists across Latin America. There have been more women presidents in Latin America than ever in the United States. So nine across Latin America versus in our country just no, none. Um, and Latin American ideas of masculinity generally allow for greater emotional expressiveness than among white Anglo men. So it may be more common for Latino male patients to cry, for instance, or to, to talk about how much they wish they could be with their children more. And likewise, Latinas um, may be very critical themselves of the social expectations for women in their, in their um, countries of origin. Now the last section of my presentation is about el compromiso, about forming a commitment to working with Latino communities. And I believe that as non-Latinos, it's important to demonstrate an ongoing commitment to our patients. Um, again, I'm just bringing in a photo of myself from long ago. And I think that knowing the language, knowing something about the specific countries and regions that our patients come from, they're both very helpful things and they show that we're committed to working with Latinos, but also just showing up with our patients, showing up to events in the Latino community is evidence of that. So another ways to show this commitment, we can continue our education by taking university or community classes in Spanish, courses on Latin American history and culture. We can visit Spanish-speaking neighborhoods in the U.S. So we could go to El Barrio of Spanish Harlem in New York City, or we could go to East L.A., or we could go to parts of Miami in Florida. We can actually travel to Latin America. A lot of us have the means to do that. And if we can and we work with Latinos, that can be very interesting and illuminating to go to the country where they're from. I also strongly believe that if you speak Spanish and you're working with patients in Spanish, it's important to seek out professional opportunities to train and receive supervision in Spanish. Um, and I did this across different clinical trainings that I had, including my um, internship year at Bellevue Hospital Center, where I did one of my rotations on a Spanish language inpatient um, psychiatry unit. And then currently in my postdoc, I work with Mexican and Latino youth in Isla Vista, California. And like the presentation today, I would encourage you to educate yourself about recent and past political events in the countries of origin of your patients, to read the newspaper, look up what's happening right now in Ecuador, what's happening right now in Venezuela. 
and also to inquire with them about the impact of immigration or if they're second and third generation, the impact of being Latino, being Chicano in the United States. Um, if, you are ha if you have the chance, I would also recommend going to events in the Latino community. This is the part where you are you become seen and which may feel a little different than the general clinical role and returns to my point about boundaries may be different. So I would encourage you to show up at things that are happening in the Latino community that are open to the public. So for example, I went to this Christmas celebration at the Teen Center La Posada. Um, I went to a community dance event that Ballet Hispanico was doing in, in my neighborhood. Um, I attend art exhibits by Latino artists in Santa Barbara and LA, in, in LA, and I've gone to music concerts from different Latino performers. Um, and also going to Latino-owned businesses is also a good way to get to know Latinos in the community and to be seen in the community. Um, with my patients, I like to acknowledge important holidays and traditions. So this is a picture here of an altar that I built with some of the teens at the St. George Youth Center for the Day of the Dead, the Mexican Dia de los Muertos celebration. And so we did a traditional altar where we brought in um, the flowers that they use in Mexico. The children made um, clay skulls to put on the altar. Um, we also did clay figures of different foods for the dead. And then they chose photographs of Pancho Villa and Emiliano Zapata and some other Mexican figures that they wanted to represent on the altar. Um, and you can find out what the specific traditions are from your patients depending on their countries of origin. And finally, um, there are ways to change your office space to make it friendlier and more welcoming and more inclusive. So I have a picture on the right of my office in the St. George Teen Center, which is a very, it's a very small space, but I've put some plants in there, um, succulents, which are common in Mexico and Central America and in Southern California. And I put a serape, a Mexican woven cloth, on this couch there. And then I have some of these images up on the wall. I have a photograph of a Mexican woman and child. I have an image of the Virgin of Guadalupe, a religious image that's very important to Mexicans. And I have a map of Mexico, which has really helped me um, understand more about where my patients are coming from. And especially the teens love to go to the map and love to show me, this is where my mother's from, this is where my father's from, this is where my grandparents are from. Um, and it feels to them really, I think, like rooting themselves in where, where they come from and who they are. So this is the end of my presentation for today. I hope that this has been helpful for you, and I welcome any questions. Doris? Um. Thank you, Emily. Thank you so much. It was wonderful. Um, Thank you. We have one question so far, one related mm -hmm. to another. What do you mean by cultural humility approach, and what would that look like in therapy? Ah, so there's some literature. Let me see if I can go back to that slide, because I think I quote that the, the, the article I was thinking of. Um, it's The idea is that instead of developing cultural competence for Pacific cultures, which might be like, well, I work with Mexicans, and I'm competent in working with Mexicans, but I don't know very much about Chileans, therefore I can't work with Chileans. The idea of cultural humility is more like, you know, I can't know everything about every culture in the world. It's impossible for me to know everything about the cultures that my patients are coming from. So I'm going to approach this as I know something, but I don't know everything. That's the idea of cultural humility. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm ready to learn from you and to acknowledge that maybe even if I have been working with Mexican communities or like me with Latino communities for a long time, there are lots of things I don't know about Latino communities. And so I'm willing to be corrected. I'm willing to learn. That's what the stance of cultural humility means. And I hope that's, that's a helpful response. I'm really, really glad you asked that. Okay. Um, so that, those are the only two questions that were related that we have so far. I don't know. I'm going to um, give the audience a chance to write another question if they have any. Okay. Or if not, we'll proceed to close the webinar. Okay? Great. Okay. So I don't think there are any more questions. Okay. 
Okay, there's a question. Let me see if I can get it. Great. Um, the question is, does Dr. Maynard recommend bringing in other people to sessions like a Santero with patient permission? You mean with regards to family? No, they mean like uh, curandera or combining oh, therapy. I have never thought about actually having a curandero in my session. But I would inquire if the person is seeing a curandero or talking to a priest and encourage them to do that if it feels helpful to them. Um, similarly, like if someone reports you know, more mainstream Americans like, oh, I go to acupuncture and I do yoga, um, this might be a complementary form of treatment. So inquiring about it and finding out if that is helpful for the person? Yeah. I also want to remind the audience that we'll, we'll post the questions and the answers on the website um, for everyone to have the information. We have another question. Are there, are there major differences between Caribbean, Mexican, and South American people, and are there similarities? Oh my goodness, what a good <laughs> question. Yes, and yes. <laughs> um, there are so many differences. So. The Caribbean was the first part of Latin, American, Latin America to be settled by Europeans, and they pretty much wiped out indigenous population, brought a lot of Europeans, a lot of Africans to work the land. Um, and then there were all different um, European groups in the Caribbean. There were Irish and English and French and Dutch um, and even Germans. And so the Caribbean cultures are very much a, a melting pot, and them being very small islands, they often had a lot of contact with other islands. Um, also, because Puerto Rico is a part of the United States, Puerto Ricans are U.S. citizens, and so it's much easier for Puerto Ricans to immigrate to the United States than Dominicans, for example, and that creates some differences in terms of um, status in the United States and ease of immigration. Um, and then talking about South America, wow, I mean, it's just, it's a huge, it's a huge continent. It's like as diverse as Europe or Africa. Um, but the countries I've lived in, Brazil, Chile, and Argentina, all have significant histories of European immigration that really peaked at the same time that um, European immigration peaked in the United States, like the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century. A lot of people from Southern Europe, so a lot of Italian, Spanish, um, also people from the, the Middle East and um, Greece and Eastern Europe. So um, in Chile, actually, there are a lot of people of Central European and Eastern European descent, and I was often mistaken for someone of German descent when I lived in Chile because there are large numbers of Germans. Um, and so the experiences of people in Chile, Argentina, and Brazil who come from those European immigrant, um, that wave of immigration, are different from the people who are descended from the Spanish, the Portuguese, and the Africans, or the indigenous people in those countries. Um, and those, I would say that Chile, Argentina, and Brazil, because of that immigration, tend to really look to Europe and to the United States as um, cultural models. So there's a lot of um, the education system is based in some countries on the French system. There's a lot of aspirations to be more like the United States or more like European countries. And then Mexico, um, I feel like, is just this really ancient culture <laughs> um, that was in in full bloom when the Spanish came. And so it's important to, to, when working with Mexicans, they're often very proud of their indigenous history. And when I like to remember that when Hernan Cortes conquered um, Tenochtitlan, the, the city of Mexico, he, he found a city that he described as looking like Venice, a city that was so sophisticated, built on this can, these canals on a lake, 
in the Mex central Mexican Valley. But his sailors were sailors that had been all over Europe and had been to Venice, and they said it was more beautiful than Venice. And so that's a culture that was destroyed by the Spanish, but the, the pride in that culture is still very strong to this day, and those traditions continue to be upheld in Mexico. There's so much to say. Um, I haven't even gotten to the similarities, but I also want to be aware of time. So <laughs> Doris, let me know if there's another question or how, you know, how we are. Darius? Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Oh, <laughs> okay. okay. So we have about two or three more questions, but we're not going to have enough time to answer them completely. Okay. So what I'm going to do is, like I mentioned, uh, I'll send you the questions in Word format, and then we, we can post the answers along with the recording and the PowerPoint slides for the webinar at, our, at our web page. Okay? Sounds good. I would just say one more thing about the similarities or some of the things that I talked about, like the importance of personal connection, family, and thinking about some of the traditional gender structures, that those are some similarities that are shared across Latin American countries. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay. So again, I'd like to take a moment and thank you, Emily, for a wonderful presentation. And again, a reminder to our attendees, the recording of today's webinar, the PowerPoint slides, along with the questions and answers, will be posted and available at our website at www.attcnetwork.org slash Hispanic Latino. Thank um, you so much, guys. Thank you. So... This concludes our webinar today. I would like to again thank you and remind our audience that if you're interested in receiving further training on, on our topics, you can visit our website and as you leave today's webinar, you'll be directed to complete a brief survey about your experience. So your feedback is very important to us and we appreciate you taking the time to tell us what you thought of today's webinar. So thank you everybody. <laughs>